It's great to, to have the opportunity to open the meeting and obviously it's really nice to get my talk out of the way um, and then I can relax. Um, uh, it's fantastic to see so many people here and I join Gert in welcoming you. Uh, my role really is to, to set the scene in some sense and, and as I was preparing this I realized how many of the themes of some of the later presentations are sort of touched on uh, in passing and I won't be explicit about, about those links, but uh, you'll see as we go through the meeting, uh, many of these ideas will come up again. So my focus is the research article, uh, a published research article. Obviously, we know this, it's a permanent record in, in, in the public domain that, that can be used by many different types of user for different purposes and maybe over very many years. Uh, and whereas some, uh, some of those readers of the paper may be very satisfied with a very quick scan, they may even just read the abstract, they may scan the article, or they may be very happy to have a, a short summary. Uh, others, uh, for example, systematic reviewers, will need to um, read very, very carefully and extract very detailed information. And it's a challenge uh, for a single article to meet all of those needs. And, and by and large, I think perhaps many of our problems are, are that articles fall somewhere between the, the needs of those two extremes. And they, they're probably too long for one group and too short for the other group. Um, but only a fully uh, reported, um, uh, an adequately reported research article can fulfill everybody's needs. Um, and, and the challenge really is, is how, how we, we meet those needs. And as I shall say, and, and I'm sure you know, currently uh, much of the research literature isn't um, adequate. Um, but one way we can go forward, and, and it's, it's incredibly easy these days, is, is using online... Um, uh, don't, no, I don't have a pointer. But online uh, web appendices to include a lot of uh, technical information that most of the readers don't want, but which absolutely should be in the public uh, domain for, for, as part of the publication record. Now, we tend to think of research articles as the end product of a process. <coughs> one conducts, a, well, designs a piece of research, one carries it out, and then one publishes it. And, and that is uh, the primary research article. But in fact, the Research article is also the raw material for, for various other processes. Um, most obviously uh, for systematic reviewers that will take these primary articles and bring them together, but also uh, other researchers are going to be influenced by what's been published uh, and, and the research will also feed into um, health policy and clinical practice guidelines. So, it's important not to see publication as the end, uh, but actually it is it's really important that the publications have enough information uh, to allow these other things to happen as well. And as we'll see that doesn't work very well. So um, I put here that the manuscript should present sufficient information uh, for readers to evaluate for themselves, reach their own conclusions about reliability and relevance. Uh, they need to know exactly what was done, whoever they are. So the goal here is transparency. If there's one word which, which perhaps underpins the whole work of Equator, it's the word transparency. Um, uh, articles should not mislead. They should be an honest account of what was done and what was found. They should, in principle, allow replication. I think as a, as a working concept, the, the, the idea should be that the method should be given in enough detail that someone else could repeat that study. Um, and the data, the results, not just the results actually, but the methodology and the results should be given in enough detail that systematic reviewers can understand what was done and make use of those results in, in a, in a meta-analysis if they so wish. I won't go through everything here, but there, one can come up with a taxonomy of, of poor reporting practices. Uh, top of my list here is non-reporting, um, often called publication bias, but the publication bias is the consequence. It's non-reporting of research findings or perhaps delayed reporting, which is bad. Uh, there is misrepresentation of a study as something which it isn't, and we've just seen an example where, where 
that was done by uh, second-hand misrepresentation, if you like. Selective reporting, I think arguably the biggest problem in the medical literature, but it's very hard to, to, to get a handle on that. Uh, the area where people have done research is on, on selective presentation of patient outcomes in clinical trials, but there's also quite clearly a lot of selective reporting of statistical analyses uh, and only selection uh, on the basis of results. What I'm going to focus on primarily uh, is the incomplete publication, missing information, missing methods, missing results, poor, poor presentation, if you like. Uh, for example, data cannot be included in, in a meta-analysis. But we also have problems of misleading, misleading interpretation, and increasingly the studies are showing inconsistency between different sources, between protocols, registry information, and publications. So you don't know which is correct, if either when you compare two records that disagree with each other. So in simple terms, you have non-reporting, selective reporting, and poor reporting. And all of these have been shown empirically to be very common. We don't really need more evidence. Well, we probably do, but, but you know, we know that these things happen. And, and the issue really is how do we reduce these problems? Um, so failure to publish is the only slide I have on failure to publish. I'll then to move on, um, but basically, if people don't publish results, as a minimum, we have a reduced evidence base and more uncertainty. But the big concern here is that the failure to publish is related to the results, and, and that the, it's the exciting, statistically significant results which are preferentially published. And we, we know that happens, there's a lot of evidence of that as well. So we, what we end up with is, is a, a diminished evidence base and, and bias as well. Avoidable imprecision and, and unnecessary uncertainty and in fact possibly misleading uh, other research because we've only seen a small part of what's on offer so, or what should be available. In terms of poor reporting, there, there are hundreds. There's, there's a considerable... Uh, amount of evidence, hundreds of review articles. I see one review of published trials roughly per week, one new review, uh, telling me that reporting of trials is not good. I knew that, but, you know, and, and journals are very happy to publish these ad nauseam, but nothing is changing, and that's, you know, what we need to try to do something about. Thank you. Um, so when we read articles, we want to know how that research was done, and often we can't. And just to say, this isn't a problem of any one part of the medical literature. It, it's not specific to trials, although those have been studied most, uh, in most depth. Uh, it's not specific to studies of medicines, and it's certainly not specific to commercial research. Uh, there are some variations, but basically it goes across the whole literature. So as I said, hundreds of reviews uh, have shown that key elements of uh, trial methods and findings are missing. I'll just very quickly show you quick details of three, just to give you a flavor if you're not familiar with this. This is a review of, uh, as you see, reports in oncology journals. Uh, only 11% of these articles were, were felt to give enough information about the intervention for, for other clinicians to use that intervention. That's, I believe, unacceptable. Um, wrong button. Um, this is a review of uh, quality of life in dermatology trials. Um, you know, we don't know what questionnaires were, were, were being used in almost all of the studies. Uh, missing data wasn't handled, uh, wasn't even addressed in most of these studies. And this is the thing that these authors felt was essential to have before and after data of the overall scores and the scores for each of the dimensions of quality of life, only 5% of this sample of studies uh, presented that information. And this is a very recent review of adherence to the consul extension for non-pharmacological treatments. And here is the percent of articles, uh, I think 260 articles, um, reporting uh, various things. The ones in dark here are the specific issues relating to non-pharmacological therapies, um, and, and in particular, information about the standardization intervention, the uh, volume, uh, in this, of, uh, this volume of activity, 
the experience of the centres, assessment of surgeons' adherence to the protocol, and so on. Uh, some of these are actually much better than we usually see, but as you see, there's a broad deficiency of, of key information. So here are some quotes um, relating to systematic reviewers' problems. This one says, risk of bias assessment was hampered by poor reporting of trial methods. So we don't know how the studies were done. Poor reporting of interventions impeded replication. So again, this is in the field of education. They couldn't repeat these interventions because they weren't reported properly. 15 trials met the inclusion criteria, but only four could be included as data were impossible to use in the other 11. I mean, this is, of course, ridiculous, but that is the situation. Poor reporting of duration of follow-up was a problem, making it hard to calculate numbers needed to treat to benefit. And one of the largest trials in this area, which found no beneficial effect, is yet to be published uh, over a decade after its completion. These are all from systematic reviews, three of them from Cochrane reviews. Um, and they're just typical, I would say. Uh, and, and they address different aspects of poor reporting. So the consequences of poor reporting is that um, assessing reliability is, is extremely difficult. The clinicians can't judge uh, whether to use a treatment and the data can't be used in the systematic review, which clearly has serious potential consequences for everyone, including the people I list here, but ultimately for patients. So reporting guidelines uh, have been proposed. They've been around for quite a while now, the first of the, what one might call the, the modern type of reporting guideline was the consort statement, first published 1996 and updated. Um, and these guidelines present a minimum set of items that should be, uh, which is, if you like, it is recommended, should be uh, reported in, in an article um, uh, reflecting in particular issues that might be related to bias, but not just that, but that's a particular issue and certainly particularly important to people doing systematic reviews. And where possible, these are evidence-based and reflect consensus opinion. Um, and, and there are some clear benefits of adherence to these guidelines, which, which I haven't time to go into. So this is the consort publication from 2010. Following the consort model, a whole lot of other guidelines have been uh, published. Some of them you will know, some are listed here. On the Equator website, you'll find something over 200, but they aren't all generic. Like, these are quite generic. Many of these 200 are, are very specific. Uh, there's, there's a hell of a lot of stuff out there. Uh, but these guidelines aren't widely known, they aren't widely implemented, and they're certainly not widely adhered to. So the impact is, is, is not being realised. In addition to reporting guidelines, there are several statements from uh, bodies. This is one from uh, a World Conference on Research Integrity, one of several that have laid down broad principles about the importance of uh, proper reporting of research, and indeed the Helsinki uh, uh, statement also addresses the same issue. So this is the st situation. Not all research is being published. Those studies that are published, the research reports are seriously inadequate on many occasions. Improvement is seen, but it's very slow over time. We do have reporting guidelines for most types of research and these statements about responsible research conduct but it's much easier to continue to document the problems than actually to do something about changing people's behavior. And that is what we see. And, and somehow we have to, to work out how to, how to change behavior. Uh, and my title said, how can we speed up progress? It seemed like a good idea when I wrote it, but of course I realized I didn't really know the answer to that question. Um, it's not easy to change people's behavior, especially when there's no obvious self-interest uh, in them doing so. Uh, I, I think all parties should have a role. I think, as I say at the bottom here, that it's time that uh, um, major bodies, I'm talking about funders, uh, educators, uh, research organizations, should recognize that this is a problem and try to do something about it. Uh, I don't see much recognition of that, taking a broad view. I'm hoping some of the later speakers will suggest ways in which that can happen. So authors should be aware of, the, they have an ethical, moral, moral, 
ethical and moral responsibility to publish their findings and to do so honestly and transparently. They need to realize that they're writing the paper for readers. The, the whole point of the article is to communicate to readers. It's not to publish. That isn't the purpose. The purpose is communication. And they should recognize the needs of future systematic reviewers, and, and they can certainly help things by being aware of and following these guidelines. Editors should also be aware of the needs of readers, and, and they should make authors adhere, find some at least better than they currently do. I think they should train peer reviewers better. All the reviews I've mentioned are of peer-reviewed articles which have major deficiencies. They should support things like registration and publication of protocols, uh, which help but don't solve the problem, but they do help to identify some difficulties. I think research funders should have explicit policies, and uh, I'd like to hear others' views on that later. Um, perhaps failure to comply with policies about publication would compromise the chances of future funding. I think ethics committees could take a similar perspective. Uh, they don't even know what's published uh, from the research which they sanction. Responsible reporting of research should be a mandatory part of training for research. It isn't, as far as I can tell. Perhaps people are taught about plagiarism, but they're not taught about all these other really important issues. And we need more research uh, into how to improve the value of research articles. Um, two studies I've seen, uh, not, you know, this is a study by Eric Cobo uh, in Spain, looking at additional peer reviews specifically uh, targeted at reporting guidelines. This was a randomized trial published in the BMJ. It found a suggestion of, of a benefit of, of this process, uh, but it wasn't definitive. A second study uh, from the Journal of Pediatric Surgery based on implementing uh, a very firm policy in 2006 and doing a before and after study showed very clear improvement in reporting when the journal implemented these policies. Uh, so it's possible to do things. Uh, that, that there should be more research in how, how we can do things better, I believe. We want to maximize the value and uh, to obviously minimize uh, the, the loss uh, of, of all the research uh, which, is, which is done to generate new knowledge. And these research articles, as I said, are for communicating new knowledge, and they're not doing it that well at the moment. We have to recognize the multiple readerships and the multiple purposes of publication. And I would say that there are ethical, moral, scientific, and financial reasons for maximizing the value of research. And the first three of those ideas appear in the three article titles here. Uh, from PLOS editors, unbiased scientific records should be everyone's agenda. From David Moore, who sadly can't be with us, um, reporting research results, a moral obligation, and failure to publish results of epidemiological studies is unethical. So these are views, I think they very starkly put, put the problems, but not the solutions. This is the title of our conference, and the first part is highly relevant. I think we need to act now. Thank you.